Hi, my name is Bill Mansfield. I am a cardiologist at Christus Heart and Vascular Center. I work with five other board certified cardiologists there, three of whom are interventional cardiologists, affectionately known as plumbers, and two of whom are non-invasive cardiologists like myself. I want to give a little bit of background about myself because it has something to do with why I'm going to be talking about what I'm talking about. I worked for several years down at the Heart Hospital as a critical care physician. That was in 2018 and 2019. And in 2020, I went down during the surge in the spring and I went down during the surge this past winter. And it was essentially um, the sickest COVID patients uh, in the Loveless system. So I took care of a lot of patients with COVID who ultimately passed away. And that's why the first thing that I want to talk about today is your COVID vaccination. If you haven't had a COVID vaccination, this is the most important thing that you can do for you, your family, and our community with regard to health. So please, if you haven't gotten a COVID vaccination, get it. It's not just for you, it's for everybody. So all of the cardiologists up here work for New Mexico Heart Institute, and that is the group that staffs the heart hospital. So an important thing to know about care that you receive here is that we are tightly tied with our colleagues down in Albuquerque at the heart hospital. So should you need more advanced care than we can provide here, we're able to facilitate care transferring you down there expeditiously to be in their expert hands. What I want to talk about today is cardiovascular prevention. And the reason I want to talk about cardiovascular prevention is because having taken care of people who were extraordinarily sick with cardiovascular disease, we're really good at that in this country and in our profession. Our acute care services are outstanding. And you'll receive those services here in the unfortunate event that you have an acute cardiac problem. But prevention is an appropriate thing to talk about in this context because it's gonna reach the largest number of people and prevent, hopefully, the greatest number of cardiovascular events. I don't want to have to see you in our clinic. If I have, there's a sense in which, as somebody who got a degree in public health, I've failed. I want to keep you out of the clinic. I want to keep you with your primary care provider. I want to keep you able to do everything it is that you want to do. So, in that context, I want to talk about cardiovascular prevention today. Cardiovascular disease and cancer are the largest killers in this country and globally. That holds for this state as well. Here you can see on the right hand side the numbers for the United States. Heart disease and cancer run neck and neck. That is the case here in New Mexico as well you'll see that cancer is a little bit more prevalent here in Santa Fe County. This data comes from a Christus Community Health Assessment that was done back in 2019. We're gonna talk about the bottom of this pyramid. We're accustomed in the hospital to taking care of people who are at the top of the pyramid and the whole concept behind prevention is to keep you from getting there. With your primary care provider, it's really important for you to settle in with them and establish the middle of the pyramid, the primary prevention portion. Control your cholesterol, control your blood pressure, control your diabetes, control your weight. These are all really important things that you and your primary care provider can do to set you up for success. I want to talk about something even more basic than that because I think it's the hardest thing for us to deal with and that is changing behavior. So I'm talking about the bottom of the pyramid and specifically how much you exercise, 
what you eat, whether you smoke. These are really hard things to deal with. And every day, as I see patients in the clinic, we're focusing on these things because the middle of it is about numbers and medicines and dialing that in. But really the hard work is changing your behavior so that you're maximizing your quality and duration of life for the long run. So here you see a depiction of cardiovascular health on the left side of the slide and cardiovascular disease on the right hand side of the slide. So cardiovascular prevention is something that spans the entire course of our lives. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, from when you were born to when you pass away. In the adult cardiology clinic, we see patients who are aged 18 or over. So having an opportunity to intervene at an earlier stage is a good thing for patients who need that. And for some of our patients who have issues with their weight, 18 is not too early to come to our clinic and talk about weight loss. So that's where we get into on the cardiovascular health side of things. You can see the arrows going from left to right, unfavorable change in your health behaviors, right? And so these are opportunities for us to move things back so that Hopefully you don't progress over to the right-hand side of the slide where you actually have cardiovascular disease and we're in the realm of secondary prevention. So seeing your primary care doctor, as we discussed previously, is a really important part of managing your cardiovascular health. In addition to what we discussed previously, having your 10-year risk of heart disease calculated with your primary care doctor is another really good thing to do to give you a sense of, well, where do I sit on the spectrum of cardiovascular disease and what I need to do and how urgent it is. That can be a really helpful number to obtain and you and your primary can do that. If you're a smoker, please work on quitting smoking. And if you have issues with your weight, do start by talking with your primary provider. But if your primary provider needs an assist, we're more than ready to help you out in that regard as well. Obesity is something that primary providers see all the time, and we do too. So this slide shows that from the course of the early 60s up till the present day, the number of people who are overweight and obese, which is defined as a ratio of your height to your body weight, a BMI, so a BMI greater than 30, that's how we define it. And this slide is very clearly showing across all ranges, obesity is an epidemic and that has a big impact on us in the world of cardiovascular medicine. And it's why we really strongly encourage you to consider weight loss. The best ways to lose weight are through changing your habits, through exercising. Typically what I recommend to people is 30 minutes a day doing something, getting your heart rate up, getting your respiration rate up, and dieting. We're going to talk about exercise and diet to a much greater degree shortly. There's always a pill these days. And so there are medicines that you can take for weight loss, but I wouldn't encourage that you do that until you try and lose weight in a more natural and frankly sustainable fashion. Drugs are not without side effects, but they are out there if you've tried and it hasn't worked out. This is something that your primary care doctor can help you with. For people who especially have diabetes and are very overweight, there are bariatric surgeries available, including at Christus St. Vincent, for taking weight off and at the same time significantly improving your diabetes. It can become much easier to control and oftentimes people can actually get rid of their diabetes altogether with a bariatric surgery. But again, 
it's not a small step to take. And the best thing to do is to try and do it on your own through diet and exercise. So initially, you should aim for about a 5 to 7% body weight loss when you're engaging in a weight loss program. And you want to use a healthy food dietary pattern, things like the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, or the Prudent diet, which we'll discuss further shortly. Increased body weight has a negative effect on your blood sugar, on your blood cholesterol, and on your blood pressure. So this slide illustrates an example of why the professional organization that cardiologists belong to, the American College of Cardiology, recommends all of their providers talk with their patients about in the context of having high blood pressure, lose at least a couple pounds of weight. And for every couple pounds of weight, two pounds of weight that you lose, on average, you'll see a drop in your blood pressure of five points in the top number, your systolic blood pressure. And so for people who have high blood pressure, you realize that that's pretty significant. Obesity and being overweight is a complicated thing. For people who are really heavy, sometimes it can be discouraging because they find it really hard to lose weight. There is some solace and significant solace in knowing that even if you're really heavy and you're having trouble losing weight, if you're getting out there and exercising, you're actually reducing your cardiovascular risk. So this slide indicates that, and it's kind of a somewhat more complicated slide, so we need to walk through it a little bit. So in the top, you see all-course mortality, CVD, which is cardiovascular disease, mortality, and then on the right-hand side, non-fatal CVD events. So, for example, a heart attack that you have that puts you in the hospital, but you don't pass away, you make it out. So you'll see the blue dots, which represent people who are heavy and don't have optimized metabolic control because they're out of shape. For people who are heavy but in shape, that's represented by the pink squares or the red squares. And you can see that there is a reduction in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and non-fatal cardiovascular events simply by being in shape, even if you don't lose weight. So the process of exercise is a really powerful thing in terms of changing your metabolic profile, which is the way that you process sugar, the way that you process cholesterol, and the impact that that has on your blood pressure as well. Physical inactivity, looking at the other side of the coin, causes issues that are outlined here. You get an energy imbalance, it's, there's a stress on your body, and again, it affects your sugar control. Inflammation becomes more prevalent, and that drives cardiovascular disease. It drives stroke, hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, cancer, and osteoporosis as well. The bottom line is at the bottom of the slide where you can see a spectrum of somebody who's really fit on the left-hand side and somebody who's very sedentary on the right-hand side. People who are really, really fit, athletes, can have an elevated risk of heart disease, primarily through heart rhythm issues. That's a very small piece of the population. Your risk goes down if you have a moderate amount of exercise in your life. And it goes up, as you can see, significantly the less and less active that you become. Exercise has a lot of benefits as represented on this slide, but without getting into the details of that, because we don't have time for it, 
let's just look at the with broad strokes what it does so it's helpful for your mind and this is something that i've been telling people a lot during the pandemic is just getting outside and walking on a daily basis for 30 minutes doing something again getting your heart rate and your respiration rate up a little bit is really good for your mindset that's really crucial attitude is in many ways everything especially if you get ill and find yourself uh, in a situation where you're in a hospital uh, and sick it helps from a heart rhythm standpoint um, you can think of your heart as a pump whose job is to move fluid around a circuit and what I tell my patients is your heart's like a house and it has an electrical system and it has a plumbing system. So exercise is very helpful with regard to heart rhythm issues and then more in the center, antithrombotic, antiatherosclerotic on the slide. Those are kind of plumbing issues and hemodynamics, the way the pump moves the fluid around the circuit. All of those things are favorably influenced by exercise. What constitutes exercise? Uh, how do we define it in our world? We use something called metabolic equivalents of exercise. And examples of that are on the left-hand side of the slide, walking or cooking or doing things around the house are a couple of metabolic equivalents. A moderate number of metabolic equivalents are brisk walking or biking kind of slowly, um, doing yoga uh, or going swimming, of course, depending on how aggressively you're swimming. And that gets to vigorous. So likewise with biking, if you're biking more rapidly, it's gonna be vigorous exercise, jogging or running, uh, playing singles, tennis or swimming laps. The bottom line is that on the right hand side, you see that we have to balance our lives between sleep, oftentimes for many of us, working where we're pretty sedentary, sitting in our chairs, not moving around a whole lot, and light activity. What we want to try and do is decrease the amount of sedentary time, increase at a minimum the amount of light activity, and ideally, increase the amount of moderate to vigorous activity, which again, I keep coming back to this, but I would just want to be repetitive to drill the point home. 30 minutes a day doing something, and it really doesn't matter what, getting your heart rate and your respiration rate up. And I tell patients, you don't have to spend money to buy a gym membership or buy equipment. Just put on your walking shoes and go outside. We're really fortunate in Santa Fe to have an excellent environment to do that in. That 150 minutes comes from 30 minutes a day times five days would give you 150. And if you do it seven days, it's even more, 210. And I push my patients harder perhaps. <laughs> But as is outlined in these recommendations, again, from the American College of Cardiology, even if you get out and do less than that, that's okay. It's good enough. Something is better than nothing. So please get out and exercise. Once again, Santa Fe is a great place to do it in. We have a really highly developed trail system around here that accommodates people in wheelchairs, all the way up to people who want to do some class five scrambling on their hike. And it's all right in or just outside of town. So it's really impressive. Take advantage of it. Moving on to dietary. The central thing is that you want to move to a diet that's really heavy in fruits and vegetables whole grains, nuts such as cashews or almonds are a good thing to add in, as are olive oil in particular. Right? Canola oil is another additive that would be okay for you to use. What you want to steer away from are 
foods, fast foods, foods that have trans fats in them, such as you know French fries, for example. And you want to move away from a diet that's heavy in red meat. You want to try and minimize red meat to one to two times a week. This is a complicated slide, but the idea is this tall vertical line represents essentially no effect. And diets that were effective in helping reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease are reflected on the left-hand side of that line. And diets that were not as effective are listed on the right-hand side. So the contents of the diet are as listed there and as we just discussed, whole grains, nuts, vegetables, fruit, fish, dairy products, a little bit less so. But the dietary pattern that they fall in are this concept essentially of the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet. Again, all of these center around a lot of the contents that are listed above. But fruits, vegetables, whole grains, minimize your red meat, white meat. If you eat pork, cut the fat off, lean pork. So this slide illustrates the impact of fruit and vegetables on mortality. A couple servings of fruit a day are going to have a significant impact on reducing your cardiovascular mortality risk. All right, and, and three servings of vegetables, same thing. So this gives you a sense of how many servings of fruit and vegetables are going to be beneficial. So two servings of fruit three servings of vegetables a day, that's gonna get you into the neighborhood of a really positive effect from what you're eating. Incidentally, these are extraordinarily large data sets. In cardiovascular disease, we're pretty spoiled because cardiovascular disease is the leading killer in the country. There's a lot of uh, experience dealing with it, and so the studies supporting it are really large and very powerful. And so these come from some really potent studies. This slide depicts the impact of a diet as described on your blood pressure. And as you can see, it can lower your blood pressure 11 points to be on a diet like this. And one thing I wanna emphasize about diet is it's about the simple things. It's the composition of the diet is as discussed. The other side of the coin is there are a lot of diets out there, you know, fad diets, so to speak, that are extraordinarily effective at helping people lose weight. But the problem is, and this has been shown again and again in large studies, that at a year's time or two years time, People gain the weight back. And it's, it's simple. Eating is a habit. And habits are really hard to change. And through force of will, you can try a, what I'll call a fad diet. And it'll work if you can stick to it. But are you going to be able to do that for the rest of your life? No, because you end up reverting back to old habits. So what I counsel my patients to do is look at what you're currently eating and try and move to this pattern that we're talking about now with more fruits and vegetables, with less red meat, with more white meat, with fish, with some vegetarian options thrown in, all right? because it's sustainable. So here's a depiction of the plate. And again, these are the essence of the Mediterranean pattern diet, the DASH diet, the AHEI diet, and the Pruden diet. All of these have essentially the same thing, and it's everything depicted on the plate there. Another key piece with respect to your diet is this concept. It's sort of the two, three rule. And that is two to three meals a day. And 
Each meal should be comprised of two to three servings, and the serving size is the size of your palm. No, your palm doesn't include your fingers. It's the size of your palm, right? And that can be a helpful thing, especially if you're trying to lose weight. It's just a good common sense way to think through portion size. With respect to salt, salt is a big contributor to high blood pressure. So the key thing that I want you to get out of this is that a teaspoon of salt is about 2,300 milligrams of salt. You shouldn't eat more than that is the bottom line. If, especially if you have high blood pressure, that's an issue. So try and roughly aim for somewhere around a teaspoon or less. And you have to include, if you eat packaged food, whether it's in a can or a box or plastic wrap, it's gonna have an FDA label on it. So you need to look at the sodium content and you need, and here's a critical piece, you need to multiply it times the serving size because oftentimes what happens is the serving size is a fraction of what people actually eat. So you need to multiply in order to ensure that you're accurately counting what's in that packaged food. Um, but the bottom line is, yeah, try and aim for a teaspoon or less of salt over the course of a day. And that's a good thing for protecting your blood pressure. Salt is frequently used in restaurant food, whether you're going to a fast food restaurant or whether you're going to a really high-end restaurant. People use a lot of sodium because it helps food taste good. And the issue that I want to talk about now is about ultra-processed foods, which are essentially fast foods, right? You can see them depicted there, potato chips, a burger, the bun the burger's on, a bagel, a piece of pepperoni pizza, a soda, right? So these are, these are fast food items. And, you know, in our lives where we don't have a lot of time, it can often be, it's the easiest thing to do, so that's what we do. And I strongly encourage you not to do this. This, this data is from a study, again, a large study, that recently came out showing a strong relationship between cardiovascular mortality and cardiovascular events and these ultra-processed foods. On the graph on the bottom, you'll see 1.0 and then you see 1.1 going up. So that's, think of it as 10%, 20%, 30% increased risk, right? So for overall cardiovascular disease, if you're eating a lot of ultra processed food, you're increasing your risk, call it 15% by what's shown there, all right? And hard cardiovascular events, 20% increased risk. Hard coronary heart disease events, 25%, and cardiovascular mortality, around 25%. So it's a huge impact. So the concept of fast food is a really important thing to talk about because fast food is convenient food. And as just demonstrated, it's not good from a heart standpoint. So. I have a master's in public health in addition to being a, a heart doctor. And I feel like I have to talk to you about the larger environment that we all live in and how that impacts cardiovascular health. Access to fast food is, from a heart standpoint, not a great thing because it's associated with more cardiovascular mortality and more cardiovascular events. It's not healthy food. And I'm here to promote healthy lifestyles. And it's hard to get enough fruits and vegetables and whole grains and minimize your red meat uh, intake, increase your fish intake, increase your white meat intake, if you're eating fast food, it's almost impossible to do and perhaps impossible to do. So that brings us to this concept of food insecurity. So the United States Department of Agriculture defines that as access to enough food for an active and healthy lifestyle. 
And healthy is what we've talked about in terms of diet. Food insecurity refers to uncertain, insufficient, or inadequate food in a home due to low income. And that, in turn, is linked with being overweight, obese, with diabetes, and with high blood pressure. So the good news is that food insecurity in this state has improved dramatically over the course of essentially 2011 to 2019. It used to be that one in five households were classified as having food insecurity in this state, and that's gone down to 15.8%, which is a long ways from 20.1%. Unfortunately, 15.8% is very high. In fact, we almost made this graphic. If you look at Arkansas at 15.9%, New Mexico is right behind that. So food insecurity, which again is lack of access to healthy food due to low income, is still an extraordinarily prevalent issue in our state. So it'll come to no surprise for anybody who lives in Santa Fe that we live in a city and a county with tremendous income disparities. And that, frankly, applies to much of the catchment area of this hospital. What you may not know is that income disparity correlates with a big difference in the life expectancy of people who live in different parts of the city, in different parts of the county. So as is illustrated here, you can see in one neighborhood, the life expectancy is 76 years. And in another neighborhood with a much higher income, the life expectancy is almost 10 years greater. And as a cardiovascular health provider, I can't help but think, given the fact that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the country, that at least a part, and probably a sizable part, of that difference in longevity is cardiovascular disease. And that concerns me as a public health provider, which brings us to this. Food insecurity is not being able to access good food readily because of low income. This is a map using U.S. Department of Agriculture data. It identifies census tracts that A, have low income, and B, where you're at least a mile away from a grocery store. So consequently, you're a mile away from good food. And it may not seem like a lot, but for people who don't have a lot, that can represent a huge barrier. And so consequently, the easy thing is to get food that perhaps is more readily available there, that isn't as healthy because it takes so much work logistically to get to the good food. And that, I'm afraid, is contributing to this difference in life expectancy that we see here on this slide. So hopefully this has been a meaningful and enlightening discussion for you talking about habits, habits as an individual and essentially community habits that have become part of the structure of our city. So changing habits is hard, but hopefully I've given you a little bit to think about with regard to how to increase your exercise, how to lose weight, how to comprise your diet in a way that's gonna keep you out of our office. In the unfortunate event that you do need to come to our office or come to the hospital, rest assured that we'll take excellent care of you. We have six board certified cardiologists. We have 
board certified cardiologists in electrophysiology or cardiac electrical medicine who come up once a week. And we have a large staff that helps us help you get on the right medications, make sure you're taking them the right way, and they can help you with these issues as well. We see about 20,000 patients a year in our clinic. Uh, in the hospital, we do roughly 600 or so cardiovascular catheterizations where we look at the plumbing system of your heart. And we serve roughly 100 acute heart attacks a year, the emergency kind of heart attack. So we have a lot of experience here. So thank you very much for your time and attention and have a wonderful day.